What's up, guys? Welcome to another session of AI6103, Multilayer Perceptron and Convolutional Neural Networks. Last week, we have talked about uh, logistic regression, uh, which is really just linear regression with a single nonlinear activation function. This week, we will talk about how do we extend um, logistic regression to a new type of net network known as multi-layer perceptron. And at the same time, we will also talk about how do we extend the binary classification method that we discussed last time to a multi-class classification method. Comparing binary class uh, classification where there are only two possible classes, in multi-class classification, there could be more than two uh, choices uh, for us to choose from. So there could be a hundred classes and uh, at any moment, each input is uh, still belongs to a single class only. Um, but we could uh, we have to choose from more than two classes uh, the correct answer. And collectively, the data set would contain data points that belong to these 100 classes. And we will see how do we extend the uh, cross entropy loss that we have discussed last time to um, this multi-class scenario. In addition, we will see another variation uh, or maybe extension on the multi-layer perceptron class of models to uh, which is known as convolutional neural networks. We will dissect the convolutional neural network into its components including uh, the convolution operation, uh, the activation functions such as ReLU, um, the batch normalization operation, skip connections, and so on and so forth. And putting them together, we will have the residual network architecture often referred to as ResNet. And we will see some image recognition data sets which we can easily apply uh, the convolutional network or the rest net, rest net network too. Okay, so we'll start with multi-layer perceptron. Um, a multi-layer perceptron is just one network where we put multiple logistic regression units together. We can put these units side by side and on top of each other. So in this diagram, I'm showing you a very simple multi-layer perceptron with, a, with only two layers. So at the input features, um, we have a input vector X that contains four components, all right? The four components are known as X1, X2 through X4. And each of the four dimension is input to uh, the three logistic units um, at the first layer, right? So I'm writing these uh, as hidden units uh, per the terminology of the earliest MLPs. But you can really think of them as the first layer of the network. And we have here I have three logistic regression units. Um, each of the unit takes the four dimensional vector X as the input and outputs a single value. So I'm going to call these values at Z1 through Z3. And on top of these three logistic regression units, I have another one, um, a single logistic unit whose input is uh, Z1 to Z3. So the three dimensional vector Z um, is input to the second layer, which contains a single logistic regression unit only. And its output of the second layer will be the output of the entire network, which we call Y hat. So um, we can really put things in uh, mathematical forms. Um, we have shown you a very basic network with a single layer, uh, sorry, with two layers, but we can really imagine doing more than that, right? We could really have uh, multiple layers of logistic regression units layered 
on top of each other, and this could extend to 50, 100, 1,000 layers if you want. Um, and each intermediate node, each unit, um, will have a set of parameters, just like a single logistic regression unit we discussed last week. So we're going to call these parameters beta. However, because we have so many units, we must be able to tell them apart. So we're going to introduce some subscripts. And for the first layer and the first neuron in the first layer, we're going to use um, the subscript 1, 1. Okay, so beta 1, 1 is just the weight parameter um, of the first uh, logistic unit in the first layer. And it's going to uh, multiply with the input vector x. So here I have the dot product between the two. And the result of that goes through an activation function, which could be a sigmoid function like we talked about, but it could also be some other type of log uh, rec activation functions that we will talk about through uh, this course. And we're going to call the output of this unit z1, comma 1. Similarly, I could have the second neuron in the first layer, and I'm going to call the parameter 1, comma 2, beta 1, comma 2. And after the dot product with its input x, um, similarly, it goes through uh, an activation function, and its output will be called z1, comma 2. So uh, that, assuming that I only have these two neurons or two units in the first layer, I can write these things in a matrix form, right? So I'm going to call the output of the first layer Z1, all right? And Z1 will be a two-dimensional vector whose components are Z1, comma 1 and Z1, comma 2. And um, I can expand that because each one uh, of the two Zs is a activation function um, inside which there is some dot product. I can write the dot product I can uh, in the matrix form by treating uh, the transpose of the beta vectors as rows of a matrix. So I, if I just put the matrix rows on top of another, I have a two a matrix with two rows and uh, P plus one columns assuming x is a p plus one dimensional vector, okay? And I will call this matrix w1, denoting that it belongs to the first layer. And my activation function is applied component-wise, meaning that each component of the, out of the resulted uh, vector from this matrix vector multiplication uh, goes through the activation function individually. So in other words, this uh, activation function operates on each of the dimensions independently, okay? So that is basically my notation for uh, a single layer in a multi-layer perceptron. How many layers can I have? The answer is I can have as many as I want, right? So, and if I do that, let's say I wanna create L layers and each layer will be parameterized by a particular matrix. So for the first layer, I have W1. For the second layer, I have W2. And all the way to the last layer where I have a vector, I should really write vector transpose um, because WL will be a row vector. Uh, in other words, a matrix with a single row. And after the multiplication, I will get a scalar and which goes through an activation function. And um, there could be, you know, multiple nonlinear activation functions at each layer of the network. And that's typically how these networks are designed. Um, you may ask if I need an activation function at each layer of the network. The answer is um, you could emit some activation functions or in other words, you could use linear activation functions in some of the intermediate layers, but that actually does not improve um, the expressive power of the matrix of the network over a single layer. 
So what do I mean by that? Imagine if I don't have um, the activation function here, I would directly multiply W2 and W1 and then multiply by X. And maybe after that, I have an activation function. And um, the by the associative property of matrix multiplication, I could multiply uh, W1 and W3, W1 and W2 together first before I do the multiplication with X, right? So I'm going to call that matrix maybe uh, W prime. And uh, this layer can be written in this way, right? So in other words, this is in terms of the range of uh, functions that the two layers can express, it is the same as um, having two, uh, having the same, having a single layer with the parameter W prime. So doing so does not seem to improve uh, the expressive power of the network very much, or it does not allow the network to uh, represent uh, a wider range of functions. So it seems that doing that is uh, somewhat uncommon. Um, you may see some of the things in, in, there are some machine learning papers that do have uh, linear activation functions, and there are some subtle differences uh, between one layer and two layer networks, uh, even if you know there's no activation function in between. Uh, but for our purposes, uh, these people, those people do it for theoretical interest. And for our purposes, uh, we do not consider these networks. Okay, so um, do the matrices, the W1, W2 weight matrices, what kind of constraints do they have to satisfy? Um, it turns out that they need uh, to have specific dimensions so that the multiplications are possible. That is to say, the number of uh, columns, sorry, number of rows for W1 must be equal to the number of columns for W2. Otherwise, the uh, vectors will not vectors and matrices will not be able to multiply with each other, right? So here I have an example. Um, if you have uh, W1 uh, being a 10 by P matrix, assuming the input vector X is P dimensional, W1 has to be um, had to have P columns, right? So uh, and uh, uh, its output is uh, the output dimension for the first layer is arbitrary as long as um, it matches with the input dimension of the second layer. Here we have W2 uh, is, uh, is a, a matrix of 10 by, uh, sorry, 100 by 10, meaning its input dimension must be 10 and its output dimension um, is 100. Okay, and W3 will be constrained in the sense that its number of columns must be equal to the number of rows of W2 and so on and so forth. And in the end, I have a vector um, whose dimension is one by K, so it's a row vector, and K is the output dimension of the layer before that, so that you can have a valid dot product, okay? And in this case, uh, the output Fx is a scalar, and if you use a sigmoid function as the activation function, this scalar value can be interpreted as the probability that my input belongs to class one. Right. So this is what we saw for binary classification um, in logistic regression, as we talked about last time. Now, if we don't have to constrain our um, output to a probability, then we don't necessarily have to use the sigmoid function. For example, for the activation functions for of the intermediate layers, um, I don't need necessarily a probabilistic interpretation. So I can use arbitrary types of activation function. And we're going to here introduce a new type of activation function known as the hyperbolic tangent. Okay, so the function is written in this form. Um, and, uh, you know, those are two equivalent forms. If you multiply, uh, for example, uh, 
e to the power of x on the denominator as well as the numerator um, for uh, this functional form, you will arrive at this functional form, right? So these two forms are exactly equivalent. Um, in terms of the functional diagram, uh, it's drawn here. And what we can see is uh, no matter what the input, the output is always between the range of negative one to positive one. And uh, it's an open interval. That means it's never going to reach negative one or positive one exactly, uh, but it can approach these two values um, as close as possible, right? So, uh, and this is this is similar to the sigmoid function behavior because it um, turns any input within um, uh, it turns any input on the real line, right, from the negative infinity to positive infinity, and squashes them into a finite range from negative uh, one to positive one. Okay, and the function is actually monotonic. Okay, so it's always increasing. Um, okay, so uh, that is the activation function, and this activation function is commonly used in uh, the intermediate layers uh, before the last layer, right? So the first, the second, the third, and the one before the last, uh, you could use the hyperbolic tangent operation um, as the activation function because uh, you really don't need these values to necessarily adhere to any uh, range or any values. And this negative one to positive one range is bigger um, than the sigmoid zero to one range. Um, so, and its uh, gradient properties are slightly better, um, though not a whole lot better than uh, the sigmoid function. And we will look at the gradient behavior of these activation functions in a little bit. Uh, so multi-class classification. Um, we have talked about binary classification uh, when we talk about logistic regression, but it is common that we could have uh, multiple classes that we need to choose from. Note that, note that multi-class classification is not the same as multi-label classification. In multi-class classification, there is for every input, there is only one true answer. There's one true ground, there's one ground truth answer. Um, for multi-label classification, for each input, there could be multiple correct labels. Uh, but uh, what they have do have in common is that there are many choices, more than two choices to choose from. Okay, so let's say, let's look at the multi-class single label scenario. Um, and we have M classes, and we wanted to classify my input X to one of the M classes. And uh, the output uh, here W is, excuse me, W is no longer a matrix vector, uh, but it should be a matrix. Okay, and this matrix is, uh, has M rows and K columns. Um, so the output uh, of the final layer would be ZL and uh, would have M dimensions. So this will belong to uh, R to the power of M. So it's, it has zero, uh, has M dimensions. Um, these values, ZR values are known as the logits. And the logits are unbounded, meaning they could really be any value, any real value you can think of. They could be negative or positive. It could be 1 million or 0 0.001 um, or negative 0 0.001. There's very little constraint on what they could be. Uh, but for M classes, we still want the uh, result to be a probability distribution over the M possibilities. And in order for the output to be a valid probability distribution, basically what I want is to get some probabilities that are all greater than or equal to zero. And uh, the sum of the M probabilities should be equal to one. 
Okay, so in order to do that, I'm going to feed the logits ZL to the softmax function. And the softmax function is written in this form. Here I am using um, this subgroup uh, ZL comma one to denote the first component of uh, the vector ZL, okay? So each component is actually raised uh, to a power, right? So we take the exponential function, uh, which computes e to the power of uh, the input. So it's raised to a power. And uh, uh, and the second step is that we're going to sum the result of the exponential functions across all dimensions and use that as the denominator um, that we divide each of the uh, exponentiated logits by. And this operation has the benefit of turning arbitrary input to a valid categorical distribution. And the result of that we call theta and each dimension of theta computed this way will be greater than zero. It cannot be zero exactly, but it could be a very small number, very, very close to zero. Um, and the sum of these things will be equal to one. So there we have a valid categorical distribution. Okay. Um, so that is uh, how do we kind of adapt the output of the network. We also need to adapt the loss function because um, the binary cross entropy loss function can only take in two classes and two probabilities, right? So now we need multiple classes and we'll see what we can do. So on the top, we have the cross entropy loss or the binary scenario where we have the label Y and y, YI uh, could be either zero or one, okay? And we have the uh, output of the network is F parameterized by W and with input XI. Um, and uh, here I have uh, y minus yi and log uh, bracket y minus the function output. All right, so uh, since yi is either zero or one, only one of the two terms will exist for each given input. So when x is, when yi is equal to zero, I'll keep the second term, otherwise I'll keep the first term. Um, so in the end, I'm really just picking um, the probability uh, as estimated by my network, um, the, prob the estimated probability of the ground truth class, right? So if the ground truth class is one, I'm going to take the log estimated probability of the uh, ground truth class one, of the cl of class one. And if it's zero, if ground truth is zero, I'm going to pick the probability corresponding to um, the zero class, which is one minus the probability of the one class. And I'm going to take its logarithm. And I'm because this is my loss function, I will minimize the negative log probability of that class. Okay, which is really just maximizing the probability of the ground truth class as estimated by the network, you know, which is why this makes a lot of sense. And for the multi-class cross entropy, I'm just going to do something very similar to that. Okay, so here, my yi is no longer a single scalar, but it is a vector with m dimensions. So my yi is uh, actually z, the integer vector uh, of m dimensions, all right? And it's known as the one hot vector because there's only out of these m dimensions, only one dimension has value one and the other dimensions all have value zero. And it may seem that this one dimension is quote unquote hot, okay? So this is known as the one hot vector or the one hot encoding of the ground truth um, so the one dimension corresponds to the ground truth class. Okay, zeros corresponds to the other incorrect choices. And um, 
I'm going to for uh, I'm uh, for each of the uh, data set. I'm going to take the dot product between the ground truth vector as well as the log probability vector. Right. So remember, after the soft max operation, the output of the network is a valid categorical distribution over the m possibilities. So I have m probabilities, and I'm going to take the logarithm of those, and then the result. So the logarithm is mod is applied component wise, and then I will do the dot product with the ground truth vector, which is in a one hot form. So what this really does is to pick out the one dimension that corresponds to the log probability, the log estimated probability of the ground truth class. Okay, and by minimizing its negative, uh, I'm really maximizing that. So the idea is, is, is really just very similar. I will maximize the probability um, or the estimated probability of the ground truth class um, which is uh, the effect of minimizing my loss function. Okay, so that is basically the simple way of handling multi-class classification using a special cross entropy loss, which is the generalization of the binary cross entropy loss, as well as the softmax activation on the last layer of my network. Okay, so so far we have defined. Uh, the functional form of the uh, MLP with multi-class classification. If you still remember our supervised learning recipe, you'll see that the, after I specify the functional form, the next thing I need to do is to find a use a procedure or an algorithm to find the optimal uh, model parameter that will minimize my loss function. That will find the best set of parameters that will minimize my loss function. And for logistic regression, we used something known as the gradient descent. Here, we're still going to use gradient descent. We're going to compute the derivative of my loss function with respect to all the model parameters, and then we will apply the gradient descent procedure. Um, this is this is actually pretty intuitive, um, but if you do uh, gradient calculation or derivative calculation, um, there is a fast way to do that, and that is known as back propagation. Okay, so I think there is a uh, there is a common uh, misconception that says back propagation is the way to minimize um, the uh, network. Uh, really, the gradient descent is the method of the algorithm that minimizes the loss. Um, the back propagation is really just a optimized or an accelerated method for computing the gradient, uh, which is then used in gradient descent. Okay, um, it's not back propagation by itself is not an optimization algorithm. Uh, we will talk about the details of back propagation in the next lecture. Um, for the purpose of this lecture, all you need to do is to understand that uh, we still use gradient descent or some variations of gradient descent um, to optimize the network. Um, the details of these things will be discussed in our next lecture. When we talked about logistic regressions, we mentioned the particular limitation of logistic regression. That is, it can only represent a linear decision boundary. In other words, it only works well when the two classes are linearly separable. Um, in comparison, multi-layer perceptron is much more powerful. In fact, uh, the universal approximation theorem states that uh, only a, 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 M, a MLP with only two layers is capable of representing an arbitrary function as long as the function is well behaved. You may ask, like, what is well behaved? And most analytical functions that we can write down, um, in fact, all the analytical functions that you can write in closed form um, is well behaved, right? Like sine, cosine, uh, the exponential function, the logarithm function, 
and any combination of these things is well behaved. Um, so we wouldn't dive into the mathematical details, uh, but you know, uh, as long uh, we we wanted to say that uh, most functions you can think of uh, are well behaved. But there are two caveats to this theorem. Number one is that this two-layer MLP requires an exponential number of hidden layer units. Um, that means it does require a lot of compute and storage space in order to represent these functions. And uh, that is also partially why we sometimes want to use a deep network with more than two layers, with many layers, because depth gives you um, the ability to recombine things um, to reach, uh, to simulate a high number of uh, hidden layer units. Um, and the second caveat is that um, the ability to represent a function is not the same as the, re the ability to learn a function, all right? Um, because uh, to represent a function means that if you know what the function is, we can design the model weights, the beta numbers, we can design the values uh, for the beta parameters such that the network gets very, very close to the function. It does not mean, however, that given some data points that we can easily learn these model weights. Okay, so this is a problem with uh, representation versus learnability, right? Okay, so um, the learnability problem is a major uh, reason why we don't use MLPs very uh, uh, very frequently these days, and we resort to other forms of networks because the learning of MLPs turns out to be really hard. And one reason uh, it is hard is because the MLPs tend to have a large number of parameters um, that could lead to easy overfitting. Okay, so this is kind of a classic um, set of diagrams that illustrate the idea of overfit, right? So remember the goal of machine learning is not only to fit the training data, but to generalize to data points that we do not have in the training data. In other words, data that we have not seen before. Um, and if you can only fit training data very well, but do not general, generalize well to unseen data is known as overfit. And uh, here we have three diagrams. On the leftmost diagram, uh, we're trying to fit a straight line to the data points. And the data points is, um, because I created the data points myself, I know these data points are created from a quadratic function with some noise. All right, so um, the ideal function should be a quadratic function. Uh, but it is possible to try to fit a linear function, a straight line to these data points. And obviously this would not fit the data points very well, right? So the function actually um, don't even describe data points in the training set very well. And that is known as underfitting. Um, in the middle, we have a quadratic curve fitted to these data points, and this seems to be describing the data reasonably well. And on the right-hand side, we have a fifth-order polynomial in the form of uh, y equal to ax to the fifth power plus bx to the fourth plus cx cubed plus dx squared plus ex plus uh, maybe f. All right, so we'll say A, B, C, D, E, F are the parameters that we can learn. And uh, for the quadratic curve, it'll be something like A, X squared plus B, X plus C, right? So we can see that the fifth order term has uh, six parameters in total, uh, whereas the quadratic curve has three parameters. And with more parameters, we're able to reduce uh, 
the error on the training set, but uh, we may not generalize as well, right? Because uh, we may be kind of fitting these data points a little too well, and uh, we're we're taking some of the uh, noise in the data points a little too literally. And um, we we really haven't extended this diagram, but if you do, like you may say, uh, this function will go down here uh, we, if we kind of expand the range of x to the right. Um, so this is a case of overfitting that may not generalize as well uh, to unseen data as compared to the quadratic curve. And the reason for that is that we have maybe too many parameters um, in, uh, in the, in the function that we're fitting. And in particular, MLPs tend to have a large number of parameters because um, every unit in the previous layer is connected to every unit in the next layer. So we have a dense matrix, right? As we described, each layer is parameterized by a matrix um, and the matrix is quadratic, right? So if you have a hundred input units, uh, if you have a hundred unit per layer, then uh, the matrix will be 100 times 100, uh, 10,000 parameters um, for each layer. So that's quite a big number. Um, so in that sense, MLPs may, be, may not be using the parameters very efficiently, and that leads us to this discussion of convolutional networks, which we will talk about next.